Hello again, Russ Barkley here with another commentary for my YouTube channel. This time I'm going to be talking about ADHD and sleep problems. I've received a lot of requests to address this, and although I do speak about it briefly in my other video on comorbid disorders with ADHD, let's take a closer look at these problems in this video. Uh, by the way, I am in my bathrobe, and it seemed only appropriate, uh, given the topic, uh, to do so. So I hope you don't mind. So let's get the PowerPoint started here, and let's take a look at what kinds of sleep problems seem to go with ADHD. Now, we know in general from various reviews of the literature, including meta-analyses of all of the studies, that on average, about 40% of children and 40% of adults with ADHD report having significant sleeping problems, uh, a rate that is much higher than we see in the typical population. So what's the nature of these sleeping difficulties? Uh, well, first of all, in the case of children especially, what we often see is that there are bedtime behavior problems. These are not sleeping difficulties technically, uh, there are problems with the bedtime routine. Uh, in other words, especially with children that have oppositional disorder or anxiety disorder, we may find that they're more defiant at bedtime, that they refuse to go to bed, that they simply ignore requests to get ready for bed and wind up staying later and later, uh, all of which leads to a lot of conflict and arguments at bedtime, none of which is good for helping children to settle down and go to sleep. So. Those kinds of bedtime difficulties, as we will see, can be dealt with through traditional behavioral parent training programs like the kind that I have in my book, Your Defiant Child. There may also be resistance to bedtime related to anxiety. About a fourth or more of ADHD children have significant anxiety disorders. Uh, and this can be simple phobias, such as fear of the dark, or a more generalized anxiety disorder, such as fear and worry about the future, uh, or about loneliness in general, uh, and so on. So it may require that we assess such children for their anxiety and try to target interventions to deal with that rather than viewing it as a sleep problem. So again, both of these, defiance and anxiety, are bedtime behavior issues, not technically sleeping problems, but they can lead to problems with sleep later on as well. Also, we find that children with ADHD, as well as adults, have very poor sleep hygiene habits. That is, their bedtime routines are unpredictable, uncertain, chaotic. They're not the same scheduled time each evening. The routine is not the same that we go through. Uh, and so therefore, part of the problem is that there is no bedtime routine. It's simply catch as catch can. Uh, and this can lead to a lot of misbehavior at bedtime. Uh, it can be the result of household disorganization. It can arise from parental ADHD that contributes more to such disorganization and even chaotic family routines. So clinicians need to evaluate the family's bedtime routines to see if intervening with those routines would be the best way to address this problem. Now, many ADHD children and adults suffer from insomnia. So part of the difficulties that this 40% of people with ADHD are having is delayed sleep onset. They're just not ready to fall asleep when other people appear to be going to bed. Now, this can arise, arise from the ADHD itself. And you'll see here that adults with AD especially report having a delayed diurnal rhythm. That simply refers to when during the day are you at your most attentive and wakeful. And adults have reported that their period of peak wakefulness is often hours later than we see in the typical population that reports peak wakefulness being mid to late morning, whereas adults with ADHD report it being mid to late afternoon or even in the early evening hours. Some people have suspected that this delayed diurnal onset may have to do with the fact that one of the genes that's a risk gene for ADHD is also one of the clock genes that helps to establish the sleep-wake cycle 
in the brain. And people with ADHD may have different genetic variants of those clock genes that can contribute to this delay in their diurnal rhythm and therefore their insomnia. But let's also not forget that stimulant medications used for ADHD do increase the risk for insomnia. Up to half of children and adults with ADHD who go on stimulant therapy report this as a side effect that is not attributable to simply being ADHD. So some of the suggestions we have for dealing with that have to do with when the stimulant is taken, whether or not to use stimulant medication at all, uh, or using some other drug that doesn't create the sleeping difficulties. Now, more frequent night waking is also a problem for ADHD kids and adults. They wake up more often, so they have less sleep, less efficient sleep, less effective sleep at helping the brain to achieve the rest that it needs, all of which can result in greater daytime sleepiness. And we know that that can contribute to inattention at school and at work. In addition, that kind of frequent night waking has also been found to be related to comorbid anxiety, not just to ADHD itself. So it could be both problems are contributing to this frequent night waking. Now, let's have a look at some of the other sleeping difficulties that can occur here. There is greater motor restlessness during sleep. Uh, Restless leg syndrome can occur in some cases of ADHD. There are some suggestions in research that people with ADHD are more prone to having restless leg syndrome, which is this almost reflexive need to move the lower part of the body, the legs themselves, um, during sleep. Uh, And this has been shown to be a separate syndrome, but people with ADHD are more likely to have it. But even without restless leg syndrome, people with ADHD are more restless and active during sleep. Children with ADHD and possibly adults, it hasn't been studied so much with them, also are more likely to snore during sleeping and to have irregular breathing sounds. And this means that clinicians or families need to rule out whether there is airway obstruction due to the tonsils or adenoids uh, and whether or not there might be sleep apnea going on. We'll talk about how to address that in a moment through going to a sleep lab and having that evaluated or talking to your pediatrician about this frequent snoring that the child may have. People with ADHD, especially younger children, often rise earlier in the morning than do others. This can lead to not only inefficient sleep and daytime sleepiness, as we've already talked about, but it also can raise safety concerns. You've got a young, perhaps preschool child, who is up and wandering the house without any adult supervision because the parents are still still sleeping. So we may need to evaluate this particular problem if it's posing safety issues for that child. Sleep problems, as I've said, can exacerbate daytime inattention and lead to daytime sleepiness at school and in work. But such sleeping problems have not been found to correlate with actual academic achievement at school. So you've got a relatively sleepy or inattentive child due to the sleep problem, but we haven't seen it translate downstream into poor achievement, though it's possible that over time that could happen. ADHD children and adults, but especially children, have been found to have more visual media in their rooms than typical children do, whether it's computers or iPads or smartphones or other screens such as televisions that are in there, they seem to have more in their bedroom area than other kids do. Perhaps it's because parents are using this as kind of a proxy babysitter to occupy the child while they go off uh, in the house and do other work or other activities they need to do. So it's basically just go to your room, play on your computer, play on your TV or iPad, uh, and don't bother me. Uh, But you can create bedtime difficulties by associating the bedroom and the bed with very stimulating or uh, activity-inducing apps, games, 
uh, computers and so on that the child is interacting with. So uh, one might be able to help these sleep problems of ADHD children in these cases by moving the screen technologies to a different part of the house so that it's not being associated with the sleep routine itself. So uh, what are the kinds of things that we can do here? I've already suggested a few, but let's go through them. If your child is having frequent night waking, inefficient sleep, daytime sleepiness, or you are having sounds of obstructed airway, snoring, irregular breathing, have your child, or if you're an adult, get evaluated at a sleep lab, which is going to do a polysomnogram, some sleep studies, and see if they can identify the source of that difficulty. In some cases, it may be an obstructed airway. And if that's the case, then removing of the tonsils has been shown only in those minority of cases to have obstructed airway to improve ADHD symptoms, daytime attention, and reduce daytime sleepiness. So yes, in some cases, you may want to speak with your physician about whether or not this airway obstruction can be corrected, perhaps through tonsillectomy, and will that improve my child's sleep? There's about five studies out there right now that show that in that minority of cases where there is obstruction, removing the obstruction is helpful to the daytime inattention and ADHD symptoms. Doesn't get rid of ADHD completely, but it can improve it. Also, treating sleep disorders may improve the attention at school, but as we've said, it doesn't necessarily improve achievement and it doesn't get rid of clinical ADHD com completely. Now, I've already suggested, if it is due to stimulant medication, then this can be addressed by backing up the time when you take the first dose. So give the dose earlier in the day to the child. In the case of the adult, set your alarm to take your medication earlier than you might otherwise do so that the drug is washing out in the day, later in the day, it's washing out at an earlier time than it would, perhaps giving you time to recover from the side effect of the medication and therefore not have so much of a problem with sleep. You can also suggest to parents or even adults with ADHD, try the new ADHD medication delivery system, the stimulant delivery system, which is Jornay PM. This is methylphenidate, but it's in a special delivery system that you take at night and then it activates the next morning, usually about nine hours later. This is wonderful for helping with morning routine problems with ADHD children where their medication may not be kicking in until they're heading off to school. So this can allow the medication to activate earlier and thus contribute to less conflict in the morning, a better behavior in the morning, uh, and in the case of adults with ADHD, earlier waking in the morning. Uh, so we may find that using a delayed stimulant delivery system like Jornay might be helpful as well. Let's keep in mind, however, that it's not always the stimulant that's exacerbating the problem. We have found that putting children on stimulants, and more recently, putting adults with ADHD on stimulants, actually improved their sleep. So stimulants don't always exacerbate sleep with everybody who takes them. They can, in fact, be helpful. Now, whether this is through improving bedtime behavior, because the child's been on medication that day, whether it is through resetting the diurnal rhythm as a result of taking the stimulant. It's not clear why that would be the case, but some people actually get better in their sleep when they take a stimulant during the daytime. Now, if it does turn out to be the stimulant medication and adjusting the timing of the medication doesn't seem to help with the insomnia, then shift to a non-stimulant medication, such as the norepinephrine reuptake inhibitors like uh, veloxazine and atomoxetine. These do not produce insomnia. And in fact, at least during the initial use of the medication, often result in a little bit of sleepiness, which may be helpful to sleep onset, but they certainly don't produce insomnia. So consider using one of the non-stimulants that's out there, such as, as I've said, atomoxetine or the antihypertensive drugs. Uh, and you can do split dosing 
with atomoxetine or veloxazine, which means take half in the morning and half in the evening. It doesn't seem to impair the effectiveness of the medication, but by taking half the medication at nighttime, you might get some of the sleep-inducing properties that the drug might create through the sedative side effect of that medication. So just something to think about and talk about with your physician. Now, melatonin taken at bedtime has been found to help with sleep, but not oral melatonin swallowed. These studies used sublingual melatonin placed under the tongue, which increases the speed with which it enters the bloodstream and gets to the brain. Some research suggested that sleep onset was about 20 minutes earlier in ADHD kids who took sublingual melatonin and about an hour and a half earlier in adults who took the oral melatonin. Uh, so that I'm not saying that oral melatonin swallowed can't help with sleep. I'm saying that the sublingual one may act faster in inducing sleep than the oral one. Now, some research suggested that by adding 30 minutes of bright light therapy, often used to treat seasonal affective disorder, by adding that in the morning, along with melatonin in the evening, did seem to improve sleep onset by an average of about a half hour uh, in some cases of kids. Haven't seen it used with adults, uh, there might be a study out there, I haven't seen it, but that's worth considering if you're looking at trying to improve this problem with insomnia. Increasing daily exercise has been shown to help with sleep at night, and that makes sense. You're more active. Your body is becoming more, uh, the, the exertion is leading to more physical exhaustion and therefore a greater need for sleep and recovery, and that could increase the likelihood of effective or efficient sleep. ADHD has been shown to be associated, believe it or not, with too much sedentary activity, too much screen time, too much TV, too much game playing, and not enough physical activity, routine exercise for health improvement on a daily basis. So introducing greater routine exercising can perhaps help people with ADHD even more than others when it comes to their sleep. We know it helps with helping to manage their ADHD symptoms and self-regulation, as I've talked about in other lectures. Now, if you're an adult with ADHD, you might consider talking to your physician about a short-term trial of a sleeping medication, such as Ambien or one of the generics that's like that, but short-term, in order to try to reset your sleep cycle to an earlier time. Sometimes our sleep habits um, are so ingrained with a later sleep onset that simply resetting the sleep cycle, either through a sleeping medication or take one or two nights and force yourself to stay up all night. And then the next night you'll be incredibly tired, you'll fall asleep earlier, and it might help to reset that sleep cycle. So just a variety of things that you might consider when it comes to addressing the frequent sleep difficulties that people with ADHD are likely to have. Lastly, let's go back and look at the bedtime routine and sleep hygiene, particularly when we're dealing with kids, but also with adult ADHD. Set a consistent bedtime. People with ADHD often are less likely to have one and stick to it. Improve your bedtime routine called sleep hygiene so that you engage in the same set of steps and routines every evening, including transitioning from very high stimulating activities to less and less stimulating activities during the hour before the bedtime is to occur. So beginning to get rid of <clears throat> evening TV, evening video game playing, or interacting with screens about an hour before bedtime. Increasing your time with less arousing activities, such as reading, playing board games with others, conversations in bed with parents or with your partner, playing more with manual toys. 
those are less stimulating activities that can help step down the stimulation as we approach bedtime. Another way to step down stimulation is to take a hot bath or shower in the evening rather than the morning in order to aid relaxation just before bedtime. When you go to bed or put your child to bed, don't just put them in a dark bedroom. You're going from a lighted, stimulating social activity to no stimulation at all, including no light. People with ADHD sometimes have increases in their activity level and restlessness as a form of self-stimulation. If you put them in non-stimulating environments and the transition to those is too abrupt, you'll find that their activity level increases. So again, by leaving on a bedtime such as a night light or a soft table light in the bedroom, by also having background music that is very relaxing, soft music, maybe soft classical, soft jazz in the background can help with that. And I'm talking about calming jazz, not up-tempo stuff. Uh, but any kind of soft music played lightly in the background can help with this transition to a lower stimulation. And then as the child falls asleep, you can go in and turn the music or the light off. Consider adding a white noise machine to the bedroom or just outside the bedroom that creates this very uh, continuous ongoing light staticky sound. There are even stuffed animals that you can buy for younger children that have this installed in it that you can turn it on, such as a sleep lamb that we use with some of my grandchildren. Uh, and that also has a light white noise machine in it that can help the child transition through this nighttime routine as we dampen down stimulation for the ADHD individual. So I hope that you found all of these suggestions or any of them to be useful. Uh, and uh, that you've understood that ADHD and sleep problems do seem to go together a lot more than one would expect. Uh, so investigate the reasons for it. Try to see if any of these suggestions can be helpful for improving it. I hope you found this lecture to be useful. Uh, if so, please subscribe to my channel. Recommend it to others if you would, please. Uh, and join me for another commentary later in the week. Thanks for joining me, everybody, and be well.